Hello, I'm Professor McCoy, this is my cat Turbo, and today we're going to be talking about the Rings of Power. Uh, now, he's probably not going to put up with this for very long, because who would really want to put up with talking about the Rings of Power for too long, so I'll try and keep this relatively brief. Uh, that does, of course, sort of betray my overall thoughts. Oh, there he goes already. My overall thoughts about the show, uh, at least as far as season one. On which note, if you care about such things, which I don't recommend that you do care about such things, uh, but if you do, uh, there will be spoilers for some various things in Season 1 of The Rings of Power in this video. So that is your warning. If you would like to come back to this after, I suppose, after having watched it, or more realistically, after after having read a plot synopsis or two, uh, then you are welcome to even come back. Now, as I've said in other videos before, I have no particular expertise in literature or in storytelling or even really in media criticism. And so because that isn't my forte, it's not it's not what you come to this channel for, really. Um, I am going to be uh, looking at something very specific about the Rings of Power uh, and something that it did uh, in a very, a very strange choice that was made in the, uh, in the writing and production of Rings of Power um, as very separate, distinct, and strange compared to the writings of Tolkien in the yeah, proper Legendarium. If you're looking for um, more extensive and uh, and more uh, literary critiques of the Rings of Power. Uh, there are plenty, plenty of those uh, floating around the internet nowadays, uh, and so you have plenty to choose from. One that I will recommend from a channel that is, by some horrible, horrible catastrophe, smaller than mine at this point, at the time of this recording at least, uh, is the Jolly Viking. He has done a fantastic job, and a very thorough job, from a very solid lore perspective, um, going through the Rings of Power episode by episode, something that I could in no way bring myself to do. So all the more power to him, and I very highly recommend uh, his videos on the subject if that is what you're looking for. Here, though, and from my perspective, um, I wanted to share an observation that I had about the Rings of Power and one particular element within it. To examine this uh, and to explore what I've noticed and why I've noticed it as being strange uh, will, require us to, will require us to look at some comparisons and co some contrast points between the writing of the Rings of Power and the writing in Tolkien's Legendarium proper that he wrote himself and that was compiled by his son, etc. In both Tolkien and in the Rings of Power, we find what, what should be called interracial relationships. Now by this, I in no way am talking about real-world races. I'm not talking about uh, people of different ethnicities marrying or intermarrying or or reproducing or anything like that. I'm not talking about black people and white people having children together. I'm talking about the races of Tolkien, that is, the different peoples, the different fundamentally different species, let's say, uh, within Middle-earth. Particularly, there have been several relationships depicted between uh, primarily elves and men, and then also, in a couple of instances, very rare instances, relationships between Maiar and Elves. We find these in Tolkien. We find these as well in the Rings of Power, even so far just in the first season. But there is a significant difference in how they are laid out, which I think might just speak to something that we can discover about uh, the, the mindset of the writers and the stark difference uh, between how they write uh, and how Tolkien wrote. So first, let's look at the canonical, lore-accurate um, Tolkien, uh, Tolkien himself um, interracial relationships that we find uh, throughout the Silmarillion, out through the Lord of the Rings. Uh, so we begin uh, with the first, sort of going chronologically, uh, which was the first interracial relationship, which was also the first and only relationship between uh, that is a romantic marriage relationship um, between a Maiar and one of the children of Iluvatar, in this case particularly an elf. And this was the marriage between Thingol, the first high king of the elves, uh, and Melian. Melian was a lesser, uh, a lesser Ainur, a Maya, uh, an angelic spirit taking elven form. And she permanently, for all intents and purposes, took elven form when she went to Middle-earth Leading a uh, leading a group of other Maya to guide uh, Maiar. Uh, apologize for the pluralization. Uh, leading a group of Maiar to guide uh, the elves to Valinor, across the sea to Valinor, through the dangers presented by Morgoth. 
Um, of course, she and Thingol uh, fell in love, and they established their kingdom of Doriath uh, in Beleriand, in Middle-earth, before going across the Sea to Valinor. And only some of the elves uh, actually crossed the sea, went to Valinor, and became, uh, became the High Elves. So this was the first... Uh, the first of several uh, what, we, what we would call interracial relationships that Tolkien depicts. That is, a relationship between uh, between two different sorts of beings. The, re the rest of the relationships of this sort that we find in Tolkien are between men and elves. This is the more typical kind of interracial relationship that we find in Tolkien, and so it is the, uh, the, the one we have more examples of when we can start looking for patterns. As an indication of what what pattern that might be, it's important to note that in Tolkien's lore, there is a strict hierarchy of the various races. This is obviously distinct from his thoughts about the real world, where there are not racial hierarchies. Tolkien was not a racialist. He didn't think that there were among men, in other words, among human beings, different races, let alone races that can be organized in any kind of higher or lesser hierarchy. However, in his sub-creation, in the world of Arda, what we find is uh, a stratification going from the lowliest to the highest, and that there are beings along each layer of that stratification, because we have Eru, Eru Iluvatar, the One, God himself, creator of all things, but then below Eru Iluvatar we have the offspring of his thought, um, or the... the There's a distinction here between the, the offspring of his thought, that is the Ainur, which are basically the angels, Ainur being the, the powers, uh, broadly speaking, the Valar, the Maiar, and those who don't enter Middle-earth, don't enter Arda. Um, and then the children of Iluvatar, which are the elves, the men, and then separate sort of to the side, not, uh, not really as part of this hierarchy, we have um, dwarves, which are the creations of Aule, who is one of the Valar, uh, but given life by Eru Iluvatar. And so they are, they're co-equal with men and with elves, but they share a different fate that is determined by Aule, their, their sub-creator. And so what we have here is a hierarchy. We have Iluvatar, maximal perfection, the absolute itself, but then slightly below, we have the Valar, the Maiar, elves, and men. Whereas in our world, we don't have a lot of these intermediary beings. We don't have other races of rational animals bearing the Imago Dei, bearing the image and likeness of God, other children of God, at least that we know about, who which are stratified between us and God. We don't have elves in our real world. And so obviously we don't have this kind of racial stratification that we do in Tolkien. But this is a very important element to remember because it gives an immediate indication of the kind of interactions that we might see between higher and lower beings. Keep this in mind as we begin to look at the other interracial relationships. So all of these are, in fact, descended in some way on one side or the other from Thingol and Melian. So all of these half-elves um, with, no, all of them, I think possibly with one exception, although that one might be apocryphal, but uh, all but ex perhaps one of them are descended from this relationship between a Maya uh, and an elf, between Melian and Thingol. The first relationship we find between men and elves is the uh, is probably the most probably the second most well known because it wasn't in any of the films. That is Baron and Luthien. Uh, Baron, a, a mortal man, uh, encountered Luthien. Uh, the daughter of uh, Thingol and Melian. And after a uh, after a long, arduous process that, read the Silmarillion if you're interested, it's much better than most people say it is, um, they marry, they have children, and these children are half-elven. They're, well, more or less half-elf from their mother and half-human from their father. Generations later, we well, generations on one side later at least, uh, we have... Uh, the uh, another marriage between men and elves, Tuor and Idril. Um, these uh, these two were the father and mother of uh, of Elwing, uh, who was the wife of Earendil, the next pair of uh, of man and elf. So Earendil Ar uh, and Elwing. Uh, this was the mother and father of, of Elrond, uh, Elrond half elven. Now this one gets complicated because. Both Earendil and Elwing were half-elven uh, of a different parentage. 
And so, because they are both half elven, um, Manwe, the the highest of the Valar, gives each of them the choice between be, uh, between uh, being one of uh, one of the race of men or one of the race of elves. And so, their eternal destiny is up to them. That is their choice, uh, and they're the only half elves. Them and their direct descendants. So, Elrond, Elros, and Elrond's children, uh, who can choose in this manner between the immortality of the elves and the the containedness uh, in Arda, in the world, and uh, the mortality of men, the gift of Iluvatar, the, the ability to leave and transcend the world and to be with Iluvatar. Each of which has its has its benefits and detriments, of course, and it is a uh, it, it is a separate gift to each of the races of children of, of the children of Iluvatar. And so we might think that, well, both of these cases, Arendil and Elwing, are half elven, and so this might disrupt any patterns we might be finding. Uh, but that is, of course, not the case, because even though both of them ultimately choose the destiny of the elves, they both ultimately choose to be elves, Arendil, for his entire life leading up until that point, had, uh, had largely interacted with and identified with men rather than with elves. And but for his love for Elwing, he would have chosen the destiny of men. But as an act of love, he decided to uh, to be forever with Elwing. Uh, and this is why we have uh, all these legends of uh, Arendil the Mariner, of the Morning Star, etc., etc. And then finally, um, the the most well-known uh, relationship between man and elf uh, is Aragorn and Arwen from The Lord of the Rings. Uh, this is as depicted in the films, um, but it's also complicated, much like uh, Arendil and uh, and Elwing, uh, but in reverse. Um, both Aragorn and Arwen were half-elven. They were both descended from Arendil uh, and Elwing distantly. Uh, and so they both were able to choose their destiny. Well, Aragorn's destiny was fixed. He was of the race of men. Um, but Arwen was able to choose between uh, between the race of the elves, the, or the fate of the elves and the fate of men. And she chose the fate of men, so she could be considered... Uh, she could perfectly well be considered to be a human being, rather than an elf. However, if you watch the films, if you read the books, she's clearly not. She is depicted, uh, she is depicted, described, and even describes and understands herself as first and foremost as an elf, rather than as a human being. Uh, and her choice is only a matter of, a cho of the choice of, the, of her eternal destiny at the end of her life. At the end of her life in Middle-earth uh, with Aragorn. And so while she ultimately chooses the fate of men, she is, for all intents and purposes, and especially symbolically speaking, and able to be understood in terms of patterns, she's an elf. And so we have here um, all of the official uh, set in stone uh, interracial relationships in Tolkien. However, there's one more worth noting, which may have been apocryphal. It's only in the Lost Tales, um, uh, which... Lost Tales? The Unfinished Tales. I'm sorry. The Unfinished Tales. Um, and that is the relationship between Imrazor and Mithrilas. You've probably not heard of this. <laughs> um, if you have, it's because you've read some very obscure source material. Um, and this is a relationship between um, uh, one of the handmaidens of Nimrodel, one of the uh, an elf in the second, age, uh, sorry, the third age, um, and Mithrilas, this elf maiden, married a Numenorean man by the name of Imrazor. Um, and they founded the the city of Dol Amroth. Uh, you, if you've just seen the movies, you've never heard of Dol Amroth. If you've read Lord of the Rings, um, you'll recognize Imrahil, uh, the uh, the prince of Dol Amroth, uh, which is the city or the the um, the Tower of the Swan, if I recall, if I'm recalling my Elvish. And it is uh, it is a citadel of Gondor, uh, of the kingdom of Gondor. Uh, and Imrahil in the Lord of the Rings is the is the prince of that city who goes to the aid of Minas Tirith uh, in the battle, uh, etc. And he is he and the royal line of Dol Amroth, the rulers there, are half elven. Uh, notably as well, uh, his sister was married to uh, Denethor, uh, Denethor II, the steward. And this would mean also that um, that Boromir and Faramir have elven blood. Uh, but they are of, of the race of men. The children of um, of Imrazor and, Im, and uh, Mithralas are uh, uh, they they have the fate and the destiny of men, despite the elven blood within them. Okay, so uh, 
that's the entire collection of inter interracial relationships that Tolkien actually talks about in in all of his works, uh, whether finished or unfinished, whether in whether in the Lord of the Rings, in the appendices, in the Silmarillion, in the unfinished tales, anywhere. This is the complete list. Now, the Rings of Power gives us two interracial relationships. Notably, neither is neither ultimately uh, culminates in marriage, in marriage, at least not yet. Um, but both, at least in one or both members of the uh, of the relationship, that's the idea. That is the goal. That is the ultimate end uh, end in mind. And these two interracial relationships we find are between Bronwyn, uh, the human woman of the Southlands. Uh, and Arondir, the Sylvan Elf. Um, and I know by saying interracial relationship within the context of talking about Arondir, yes, it's going to bring up ideas of, of well, because she is depicted as it. She is, the the actor who plays Bronwyn is a white woman, and the actor who plays Arondir is a black man, and so by talking about an interracial relationship, we bring in wor real world politics that I would desperately like to ignore. Rather, what's more interesting to me is the the racial dynamic between a human woman and a uh, a male elf, an elven man, uh, because this is one of the uh, one of the relationships that we see depicted. Of course, they don't bear children, at least not so far in the first season of the series. That could, of course, change along the line. Who knows? Uh, but at this moment, we don't have to worry about any more half elves. We do need to worry about the um, the interesting symbolism that is apparent from uh, from a human woman and an elven man. Now, the other interracial relationship is distinctively one-sided, um, and it's also rather disturbing for all sorts of reasons, um, and that is the uh, the proposed relationship, or the relationship or proposal, between Galadriel and Sauron. And this is where we get spoilers, um, because we see this, this companionship, I suppose, develop between, uh, between uh, Sauron in his human form, um, and Galadriel throughout the series, and when he finally reveals who he is, reveals himself as Sauron, he proposes marriage, that they, uh, that she be his queen, and that they rule Middle-earth together. Now, Sauron is a Maya. Despite his appearance and his depiction and his disguise as a mortal man, he is a Maya. He is a lesser angel of the same kind as Melian. And so, once again, what we have is an interracial relationship with this particular higher and lesser dynamic. Okay. Now, if you've been ca if you've been following along and if you've been paying special attention both to uh, to the members of each of these relationships as well as the order that I've said to them, you may have noticed a pattern. The pattern is all the same throughout all of Tolkien's uh, Tolkien's original interracial relationships. Is that the woman, the female? of the relationship is the higher being, and the male is the lesser. So first of all, we see, uh, we notice that the only elf who marries a non-elf, the only male elf who marries a non-elf, is Thingol, who marries Melian, a Maya, higher than him, someone who is above him and unachievable. And yet all of the other elf-human elf relationships that we see throughout all of Tolkien are, as depicted, are human man elven woman. Every single one, whether that's human and elf, or whether that is elf and Maya, are the lower male, the lower man, so to speak, uh, is uh, is looking up upon his beloved. We find this dynamic inverted with the two cases of interracial relationship we find in the Rings of Power. We find Bronwyn, the mortal human woman uh, who is in love with Arondir, the elf, the immortal sylvan elf. And we have Galadriel, who is, uh, well, not in love with, but is being pined, uh, pined after by Amaya, uh, an angelic being distinctively above her in the order of creation. And so what we have here is an inversion. We have the, uh, the lower woman and the higher man. Now, there are lots of interpretations for this and why this might be the case. We might say, for example, uh, that that the showrunners see uh, see men as lesser, intrinsically maleness as lesser, and so men are uh, in order to to find an equal pairing, we have to have a higher um, a higher race of male 
to be worthy of a female of a lesser race. Maybe that's it. Maybe it's a, a feminist angle. Maybe it's the opposite. Maybe it is the kind of thing where where we have a uh, a man, a male of whichever species, condescending to a woman of a lesser race. So we have the elf condescending to uh, a mere human woman, or we have the uh, the Maya. Um, we have the Maya Sauron, uh, Sauron condescending to the mere elf Galadriel. There are all sorts of uh, there are all sorts of interpretations of this, uh, or or perhaps the showrunners didn't really think about the interracial nature of these relationships and merely wanted wanted a particular romance involving Galadriel and wanted a romance between uh, between um, Bronwyn and a uh, and. Uh, an Arendir, if he is maybe as um, as occupier or as as the foreigner or something like that, maybe it was something simple like that. Who knows? But I think one thing that we can point to is something that they at least missed. The showrunners for Rings of Power at least missed the reason for this consistency in Tolkien. And the reason, if you look at the the uh, the descriptions, the stories, and the poetry especially the poetry surrounding each of these interracial relationships written about by Tolkien, we see a very specific picture developing for the reasons for why these relationships occurred and the, why they recur occurred in the direction or the, the sort of symbolic pairing that they did, which is purely romantic. Romantic in the, in the classical sense, in the sense of romantic poetry, etc. Where the male, the man, is seen as pining for the higher, unachievable, almost angelic, or in one case, literally angelic, woman. And so just like everything we see in Tolkien, everything we see about Tolkien's imagery of the feminine is a romantic expression of, um, of the angelic ideal. It is the kind of thing that we see in Marian imagery, hence Galadriel being expressed in, in consistently Marian imagery throughout uh, throughout the Lord of the Rings, uh, with Meliam, the girdle of Meliam protecting the kingdom of Doriath. Again, Marian imagery of uh, of uh, Mary, the mother of God, protecting the church. All of these things are very, very explicit, or well, they're implicit, but they're very clear, symbolically speaking, in Tolkien's writings. And what we see here, the reason for this is that Tolkien is expressing the feminine, particularly symbolically the feminine, as something which is higher and above, greater, more graceful, uh, more, uh, I hate to put it so maybe simply, but I think it's, it's accurate, more beautiful. And so naturally, the higher in a relationship between, to between two unequals, the higher would of course be the woman. Because that is how a man ought to ought to treat and ought to understand the woman that he loves as something that is above him, something that sh should be out of his reach. But by her grace and by her beauty, she has uh, she has brought him up to her, and that's what we see consistently in every case uh, in Tolkien, whether that is Thingol and Melian, or whether that is any of the number of of uh, of man and elf pairings. In each case, we see the the most beautiful depiction of a woman, a man seeing her, a man falling in love, the woman falling in love with him and his uh, and his attempts to reach her and reach out to her, and then they come together into this, this beautiful union. We don't see this in the Rings of Power, and I think it's because there is a distinct lack of romanticism among modern writers. I say modern writers, writers who are within the modernist tradition that Tolkien balked at, Significant, because we don't see the kind of um, the kind of imagery of divine beauty that we see in Tolkien. If anything, we see a kind of uh, a kind of lower worldliness on, on both partners in both cases, really. So I think that this is one point where the writers of the Rings of Power dramatically missed the mark, and it's something that I don't think anyone else, to my knowledge at least, has noted, has made note of, has really criticized them for, because it's a small little point, and it's a, it's a, it's a highly abstract and a very symbolic point, but I think it's very crucial and very important to understand some of the thought of Tolkien, and especially to understand why it is that Tolkien, uh, why it is that Tolkien wrote relationships, broadly speaking, human relationships, 
romantic relationships in the way that he did. That is, incredibly romantically. In a way that modern writers simply can't understand. So I may wind up uh, as well having other uh, other thoughts on Rings of Power. We'll see. Um, again, I will try and lend my particular philosophical expertise uh, to looking at these uh, looking at these topics if possible. Um, but if not, uh, I will be well and happily done <laughs> with this show. Um, but we'll have to wait and see see if other thoughts come up. So with that, uh, I will leave you all until next time. Thanks for listening, and I hope that uh, I hope that this has been a a new novel exploration of an interesting topic.